Good. So good afternoon, everybody, and um, from those who are listening in virtually from across the Atlantic, good morning or good late evening for those in, in Asia. My name is Klaus Dillmann. I'm head of division in the Directorate Supervisory Strategy and Risk of ECB Banking Supervision. Uh, please let me make upfront uh, a few housekeeping announcements. We have in this session uh, three papers, and uh, we have allocated it uh, in the following way. We have 20 minutes for the author of the paper to present, then 10 minutes for the discussant, and then 10 minutes uh, for a discussion. We take questions from those who are attending from this room and also from those who have joined online. In order to help presenters and discussants to stick to the timeline, Andreas will help us by uh, waving warning signals when you're coming close uh, to the end. Uh, I may ask those who are here um, on the table that we need to press the button for the microphone because otherwise the people who have virtually joined will not hear us. Please um, keep this in mind. Now, uh, let's move uh, to the content of the first session. What is the common theme in the first session? One way to look at it is to see that they contribute to assessing in different ways the effectiveness of the regulatory response to the global financial crisis. The first paper looks at a forward-looking provisioning approach. The authors see new provisioning roles in Colombia as an anticipation of the expected credit loss framework, as it was called, as it was introduced um, by the IFRS 9. Uh, this is um, work presented by Jose Luis Pedro from Imperial College and discussed by Skanda van der Heuvel from the Federal Reserve Board. The second paper explores internal capital targets of banks and their interaction both with the use of capital buffers and with lending supply, also for different characteristics of banks. This is presented by Cyril Coalier from the ECB and discussed by Florian Haider from Goethe University. The third paper inspects the impact of the ECB dividend recommendation on bank lending. This will be presented by Ernest Dautovic from the ECB and discussed by Diana Bonfin uh, from Banco de Portugal and University Católica Lisbon. The second and third paper also have in common that they use the COVID-19 pandemic as a test case for the analysis. So they also contribute to the corresponding strand of literature that is uh, still increasing. The key variables considered in all three papers, first one, credit provisions, second, capital targets, third one, bank payouts, are also key variables for supervisors to carefully monitor and assess in ongoing supervision. So the policy relevance is clear and needs, I think, no further motivation so that in the interest of time, I'm happy to give the floor to Jose Louis for the first paper. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for, for the invitation. So this paper is uh, co-authored with um, Bernardo Moraes from the Federal Reserve, Guy Gaifka uh, from ESE, Monica uh, from Pennsylvania State, and Miguel from the Banco de la Republica of Colombia. So uh, loan loss provisions is the highest accrual for banks. There has been, uh, until recently, the incurred credit losses in which basically it resulted in too little, uh, too little provisions, too late. Uh, Luke has a very famous paper in 2004, if, you, if I remember correctly, on, on these issues. And basically, the, the, pro the, the problem of this uh, type of approach is that then in the, uh, in the middle of a downturn, banks will have to increase very fast uh, the specific provisions, and this might create potentially a credit crunch in the economy and, and lower profitability and capital for banks. So there has been introduced both in the United States and in Europe uh, from 2018 to 2020, the expected credit losses. And the big difference between expected credit losses and, uh, and incurred uh, credit losses is that for the origination of loans, and for loans which are still below 90 days of, of delinquencies, if you want underperforming, under the incurred uh, credit losses, the, the loan allowances were zero, and under expected credit losses, they are positive. This is the big uh, change. Uh, so the big change is that when you originate a lot, a loan, you are already thinking about future losses, and you start, have, you start uh, the provisioning already there. 
Now, uh, this is very important for accounting, but it's also very important for policymakers and supervisors uh, because, in a sense, this might create, this potentially might reduce the procyclicality in the banking sector and at, at the same time to better align risk-taking incentive, uh, risk incentives uh, for banks. You know, as, as Andrea was saying before, risk management has been one of the key issues uh, in the bank failures in the United States. Now, there was the COVID-19 crisis, so one could have seen these issues in the COVID-19 crisis, but they allow the supervisors, they allow banks to defer uh, the introduction of uh, the ECL, and, you know, at the end it was a description of the banks to use it or not to use it. And as I was saying before, this is very important, not just for policymakers, for accounting. So accountants think that this is the biggest reform, uh, even more than IFRS. Now, we check in Colombia. Why Colombia? The first thing in Colombia is that this was uh, introduced more than 15 years ago. I will explain you exactly what it was introduced. It was more forward-looking provisions. So in the sense that we, you know, loans at origination or loans that are underperforming, so below the 90 days, or loans at origination, they have, uh, you know, uh, have to provision, like in the uh, expected credit laws. And then just, this is an academic paper for identification, just for the, the issue about identification, empirical identification. There is some discontinuity, a particular discontinuity, which firms, you know, which are very similar in all the things, but they are very, just, just there is a random number of 50, uh, sorry, of 2 million uh, uh, pesos, uh, Colombian pesos cop, around 2 billion, then you would have uh, more or less provisions. Yes, because smaller firms tend to have a higher probability of default than larger firms, and there was just a particular rule, and this rule is, is helpful for us just for the identification. Basically, if you were a firm uh, below uh, this uh, 2 billion, then, uh, you know, even at the beginning with no arrears at all, you would have to provision, and you would have to provision more than uh, firms which are a bit larger. And this is just introduced, so before this, if you were not in arrears, you wouldn't have to provision at all. So it was zero. Okay, so it's the introduction of the provisioning for expected losses and a bit higher for smaller uh, firms. So what are the preview of the main results? The preview of, so I'm going to tell you two types of results, one more for policymakers and then the, the results of the paper. So the preview of the results is, the first one is that this uh, change in provisioning implies a reduction in credit to firms. This will have an associated reduction in real efforts for the firms. And we're comparing firms which are extremely similar around this continuity, but they have more provision and less provisioning due to the rule. The second thing which starts being very important for, for policy is that these effects are even stronger in bad times. So the issue about procyclicality, reduction in procyclicality, we don't see it there. We don't see it there. The evidence of the mechanism is that this is truly through an increase in provisioning between the, the, the different type of firms and before and after. And then th there is gonna be a complementarity with capital. These effects will be stronger for banks that have less capital. Then there is regulatory arbitrage. You might have rules, and this is a question uh, I was posing to Andrea, so that you might have rules, in this case, regulations or accounting, but there might be an issue which is, you know, maybe banks react through unintended consequences. And here the unintended consequences is that now the banks are making less profit from these, these loans. So what we find is that they will do a search for yield within the high uh, provisioning, within the loans to high provisioning firms. They will try to, within these, they will try to go for, the, for a higher search for yield, especially banks uh, with less, uh, less capital. And this will end up in, uh, higher, in more concentration and higher spot defaults through these unintended consequences. So the, the key policy message of the paper is the first one is, which I think is important, there is no clear, uh, there is no clear reduction in procyclicality with forward-looking provisions, okay? The effects are even stronger uh, in bad times. Second thing, uh, there is a complementarity between provisioning and bank capital. Of course, uh, provisioning and capital, uh, they are different in the sense that they affect profits potentially taxes differently, one is more for expected losses versus unexpected losses. In, you can, par, uh, can have as part of the provision in tier two and the other is tier one. 
And nevertheless, both of them are, are coming from the shareholder funds. So what we find is that the negative impact on credit on the higher provisioning is enhanced if the bank has less capital. In fact, uh, in fact here in the string case, uh, if I, in this one here, there is this reduction in credit in bad times is zero with the new provisioning of forward looking if banks have enough uh, capital, if they have high capital levels. So in a sense, this is something that are not independent, they are complementary, these policies. The last point on bank supervision uh, for this regulatory arbitrage is that there are unintended risk taking. So the other uh, point which is important, apart from, from, from the procyclicality or the complementarity between bank capital and provisioning, is that you want them to introduce these reforms in order to have better risk taking. And what we find is that, not surprisingly, banks adjust in, in the margins in which they can take more risk and they get higher yield uh, within the stuff that they have to provision in uh, similarly. And this is what we find in the data. This is an example risk taking, but exposed it has a more concentrated uh, effects. And you know, and concentration is important. We saw it in the Silicon Valley Bank, just to put an example. Or they have higher exposed loan windows. And basically in this, um, in eight minutes that I uh, spoke, I just gave you like the big um, overview of the paper. Now the rest of the times are just uh, details. So the first thing is that uh, we use credit register data much with firm and bank uh, uh, supervisory data. The provisioning law is from May uh, 2007. They affect uh, firms in different ways. And uh, we are not gonna exploit all these things, but because in a sense, our paper is academic and we want to exploit something which is a bit better on identification. So we want to compare firms which are similar, but they have this different provisioning. Okay, so, and we will use this exogenous arbitrary threshold of two billion COPs. Also, we will have a long period of time. So we will have a crisis before and a crisis afterwards, like recession before, recession after. And so we're gonna see whether the implications of procyclicality in, in recession times are different with the provisioning scheme of forward-looking provisioning versus the all incurred uh, credit losses. And, and, the, and the data goes from two, uh, 2001 to, to uh, 2016. So the sort, uh, now you will see lots of stuff, but let me just uh, go a bit. So now you will see around the provisioning so these are firms which are more affected, which are the red ones, less firms which are less affected. The provisioning of these firms just before the introduction were similar. And after the introduction, these firms below the, the threshold, they have to provision more and indeed they provision in more. These are tables on the left hand side is loan volume. And so we find that around the threshold, remember the threshold is two billion. So once after the introduction of the provisions, firms that have to provision more, they, what they will see is a reduction in credit. And this is not a question of a smaller versus a bit larger firms. They are very close to around the threshold and we can be as close as possible to the threshold. But if you see thresholds which are lower, so this is from 1.5 to 2.5, this is from 0 0.5 to 1.5, you don't see anything. And these are smaller firms. Or if you see thresholds above, you don't see anything. So it's just around the threshold in which some firms that have to provision more than others is then banks will react by cutting credit to those firms. This will have negative real effects. It's not only a reduction in credit, but those firms around the, around the threshold that they have to provision more, they will have not only less credit volume, less lower liabilities, lower sales, lower assets, and lower investment. Okay, so there will be some negative uh, real effects at the firm level. As you can see here, uh, I cannot close because I have in the micro, but as you can see here, everything comes just after, immediately after the introduction of the regulation, both the provisioning, both the reduction in lending, and uh, you know, it's not only a reduction in lending, it, these firms are less, uh, you know, you have to provision more, so not only you give them less lending, but you increase the interest rates and you reduce the maturity. Red reduction in maturity is another way of tightening lending standards. And so and this is immediately. So this is the first part of the paper, short windows, but we want to analyze crisis times, so economic cycles. And we have, you know, like uh, recessions before in the sample, in the global financial crisis, and even later. 
Even before in the credit sample, the sovereign uh, CDS of, of Colombia was relatively high and unemployment was also high. So in a sense, we have you know, uh, bad moments before the introduction of the, uh, of the policy. The policy was introduced in May 2007. Then we will have some unemployment in the global financial crisis and then so once we analyze the, the, the cycle, now as you can see here, so this is the, what I showed you before, after the introduction of the policy, firms that are more treated, they have to provision more, there will be a reduction in lending for those firms. And this effect will be stronger when there is a weak GDP or when there is a recession. And again, all this only happens around this threshold of firms, which are very similar, but one have to be provisioning more than the other but it doesn't happen to other type of thresholds, arbitrary thresholds, in which all the firms have similar uh, provisions. Uh, there will be also associated real effects. I don't need to go to all of these things, but what you will saw right now on credit, uh, it will also happen for real effects in the sense of liabilities, sales, assets, uh, investment, and survival of the firm. This is, everything is related to provisions, Everything is related to provisions, meaning like you have to provision more, uh, you know, for these firms that have to provision more. Indeed, they provision more, and especially in bad times. So this is the problem of, of the procyclicality. So this is better credit loss force banks to provision more in crisis times. And so the procyclicality that, you know, was at the idea of reducing procyclicality, and we saw this in the COVID-20. That's why, no, you guys here stop, I mean, you kind of water down this type of provisioning. Uh, both in, in US and in Europe, because you were afraid, uh, you know, you were afraid. And also there was a substitution with capital, no? Capital buffers went down. So you, you, there was a water down of, of this. And it's precisely because of this, because they do provision more in crisis times when uh, there is a weak GDP. Uh, then we have a result on bank capital and provisioning, which is also the second type of result, which is important. So as you can see, what I was telling you before, that they have to provision more, the firms that have more treatment, there will be a reduction in, in credit because of the more provisioning. This is somewhat reduced, but not eliminated, but somewhat reduced if the banks have more uh, capital. Again, only this happens around the threshold of being more or less provision, provisioning more or less, but it doesn't happen in other thresholds. Now, what, what happens in the crisis times? In the crisis times, it's, like, it's the same thing. And now there are many tables and many, uh, and many rows, and I'm very used to read these things, and it's very difficult for you. I show you many tables, it's very difficult. But just trust me, like for instance, in this one, there is a reduction, you know, there is a reduction in credit in crisis times for the firms that have to provision more after the introduction of the provision. But this coefficient is completely killed if banks have more capital. So basically what this is saying is that these negative effects of provisioning on the reduction in credit in crisis in recessions or crisis times could be completely uh, mitigated if banks have enough uh, capital. Because remember that it, there are many dif there are differences between provisioning and capital and we, I explained this to my students and you know but at the end of the day both come from shareholder funds. So in a sense if you have a lot of capital then you can, uh, you know, the increase in provisioning, even in recession times, will not uh, uh, imply a reduction in credit if banks are highly capitalized. This is what we find. Then the final thing, I have um, four minutes. So regulatory arbitrage. Now, these firms are making less profits. Provisions implies a reduction in profits automatically. Everything else goes. Now, the time when you lend to firms that require more provisioning, more because of the expected, the forward-looking provisions, the expected credit losses, then you are making even uh, less profits in those firms. So how do banks are going to react sometimes? They are going to react by going to riskier borrowers, not because of the sake of taking more risk, but because they can search for a higher yield. Okay? And this is what we find here. So. You know, again, as before, if you, these firms that you have to provision more, you will cut lending to those firms. But you see, in these firms, you will completely offset that by taking to the highest yield firms with the higher provisioning. With the treated firms that you have to provision more, on the high yield firms, 
exposed, you will start lending more to those firms and you completely kill the effect. So in a sense, you have to provision, you will cut lending, but within the high provisioning firms, you still want to make the all profits. So you will go for the riskier ones because they give you an ex ante yield. And all these things are driven by lo lower capitalized banks. In higher capitalized banks, you don't have these things. Again, another complementarity between bank capital and provisioning. And this only happens around the firms uh, in the reform, sorry, around the firms uh, related to the reform, but not in the other type of firms, in which basically these ones are placebo tests, in which all the firms are similarly, so the level of provision to these firms is, is similarly changed. And the final table, there are already many tables, let me just give you the, the headline result on the top. This ex ante risk taking uh, and these unintended consequences uh, imply that these banks that they do this, they end up with higher concentration of, of loans and with more exposed uh, default. So you do care as a supervisor uh, of these things. So let me, in the last two slides, just go back to the, to the, to the results. And let me just point, pay more attention to this one, to the main policy messages. So the first thing, and this is in a sense what we, truth, we, we kind of saw in the COVID, but in the COVID there was endogeneity of banks taking this uh, provisioning, and then there were the regulators softening this provisioning. So these forward-looking uh, provisions, they are gonna increase the provisions in recessions because there is much more risk at that time, and this will lead to a reduction in credit. So the procyclicality will be even worse. Now, this is what we find. Second thing, there is this complementarity between bank capital and provisioning, meaning that despite of many differences across the two, uh, you know, remember profits, taxes, uh, expected losses versus unexpected losses, tier one and potentially tier two, both come from shareholder funds. And this implies that, you know, the, the reduction in credit uh, due to higher provisioning will be reduced if you have more capital because you have more shareholder funds. In the string case, which is very powerful, in the string case, this reduction in procyclicality, that, this increase in procyclicality, that is this reduction, stronger reduction due to the pro provision in the skin in, in bad times, will be completely mute if banks have high levels of capital. That will be, you know, like you cannot treat these re uh, reforms independently. They might be complementary on our evidence, both in good times and in bad times, is that they are complementary. And the final point is supervision is important. You may have rules, you may have rules, but you need the supervision over and above the rules. Why? Because banks, they will adjust on the margins, they will adjust to the old times. I always put this slide on my students on, on this book by Tommaso de Lampedusa, Il Gato Pardo. They will always try to find uh, ways to, to, to have the same privileges as before. In that case, in the book, it's about the aristocracy in Italy, in this case, is about uh, getting profits. And this might not imply anything, this higher risk is taking, but exposed, they end up with more risk, both in the concentration and in the exposed loan defaults. Uh, and the final slide, uh, thanks. Thanks a lot, and the discussant of the paper is Skander van den Heuvel from the Federal Reserve Board. Thank you, Luke. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me to discuss this uh, paper. Um, and uh, it's so nice to see so many familiar faces. Oh, here we go. I have to um, just say that the standard disclaimer applies. These are just my own views since I'm at the Federal Reserve Board. Um, so the main message of this paper, uh, the way I took it at least, was that it really calls into question um, the desirability of uh, the expected credit loss uh, provisioning um, and uh, including the notion that uh, ECL, as it's known, uh, can reduce procyclicality. So it really raises some questions about that. Uh, more specifically, it finds that the introduction of forward-looking provisioning in Colombia in 2007 had the following effects. It led to higher provisioning and higher loan interest rates. Uh, it led to declines in credit and economic activity at more affected firms, uh, as Jose Luis explained. Uh, 
And moreover, these effects were more pronounced in times of economic stress and uh, for banks with uh, less capital. And there's even some evidence uh, that uh, these banks searched for yield within uh, groups of firms, uh, lending more to, to riskier firms, higher yields. So, um, you know, if um, incurred credit loss provisioning is too little too late, as some have claimed, uh, it begs the question whether ECL is then too much and too pro-cyclical, or still too pro-cyclical. Um, so that's sort of what I thought of as the main takeaway from this paper. Just a little bit more detail, and then, and then I'll, uh, I'll give some, some, some further comments. Um, so the setting, as Jose Luis uh, explained, is the 2007 Colombian reform that replaced uh, ICL, incurred credit loss provisioning, with forward-looking provisioning, which is, you know, if you look at the details, it's similar to, to an ECL approach, expected credit loss. That seems to have been also the intent of the, of the reform. Under the new model, you have these prescribed probabilities of defaults, PDs, and loss-given defaults, or LGDs, and they depend on some variables that you'd expect, the number of days past due, the collateral, uh, but also borrower size. And, um, you know, that, that will come back uh, in a moment. Um, overall, the reform raised required provisions uh, in addition to making them more forward-looking. Most of the causal identification is based on this somewhat, on a somewhat arbitrary uh, size threshold. Um, and, and so the, the, the paper and a lot of the exercises compares firms just below the threshold and just above the threshold, right? And, and arguably these, these firms are, are, you know, shouldn't be that dissimilar because they're, they're just below and just above. And then you can identify the causal effects even if there's other things going on at the same time in 2007, uh, which, uh, which can always be the case. Um, and so the key thing there is that post-reform, there were higher provisions for loans to firms with uh, less than uh, $2 billion in assets. Okay, so overall comments. So, I, I, you know, the paper has a compelling identification of the effects of the reforms. It's really, in a sense, uh, the reform is um, it, 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 looking at the joint effects of higher provisions as well as forward-looking provisions. Now, you might say ECL is always going to entail higher provisions. I don't know if the Colombian reform was particularly um, uh, harsh on that, particularly uh, stringent, I should say. Um, the paper is very well executed, uh, placebo tests, uh, the right fixed effects, right standard errors. So at least um, I thought it was very well done. Uh, it also has the benefit it can show the persistence of the effects that it finds, and that's because the reform was already a while ago, uh, whereas uh, IFRS 9 and CECL were, were much more recent. So, so papers looking at that can, uh, can't go that far out. Um, the impacts are economically large as well as statistically significant. Um, and, um, you know, um, maybe one question one has about um, uh, uh, papers that look at a particular historical episode, we should always ask, you know, how, what's the external validity? Um, I'd like to maybe know a little bit more about what's special about the Colombian banking system uh, or maybe the reform compared to, um, uh, compared to CECL and uh, IRFS9. How much can we extrapolate? Um, so in the remainder of my comments, I'm going to talk a little bit more about so that the last two points, they shouldn't detract that I really like the paper, uh, but I'm actually going to take the results really seriously and see, you know, try to put them together uh, l by looking at the, uh, the economic magnitudes. Okay, so, 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 so let me try to do this in five minutes. So the reform raised the prescribed PDs, probability of defaults, at origination from zero to 1.1% for larger firms or 1.6% for smaller firms. Okay, so the difference is 50 basis points, right? That's, that's where the paper is going to get most of its identification. You'd expect the differential effect on provisioning to be less than 50 basis right, points, right? Because LGD is going to be less than 100%. LGD depends on collateral, other things, uh, 
but, but sort of in general not more than 50 basis points. The difference in provisions observed between the firm groups is um, 1.1 percent, uh, one percentage point, excuse me, uh, or 1.4 percentage point, depending on, on whether you're just looking at straight up difference or whether you're controlling for other loan terms. So it's the same ballpark, but it is substantially more. And um, so it made me wonder where that's coming from. It could be that there's a number of outstanding loans because the paper, the effects in the paper are not just on loans at origination, but, but the whole portfolio of each bank. And so maybe there's some outstanding loans that are, um, you know, between 90 and 150 days past due, where the difference between uh, the pre and post reform and the two groups is larger. So is that the reason or is it something else? The paper could check, I think, and, and it would be nice to see. Going further along, and this is just shows the effect of, of provisions for the, for the two groups, which uh, Jose Luis also showed this picture. All right, going further in the economic mechanism, once you know provisioning, the next cause, link in the causal change is to look at the lending rate, right? So doing a really crude back of the envelope calculation, 1.4% um, higher provisioning rate, if we just take that as given, should raise the lending rate by 0.014 times the required excess return uh, on equity, right? How much, how much more expensive is equity relative to other bank funding costs? So if that's 10%, which I think is a high number, then it should raise the loan rates by 14 basis points. If it's 20%, let's say it's high in Colombia, then it would be double that. What do they find? They find that the lending rate goes up by 0.6 to 0.8 uh, percentage points. Um, so maybe again, same roughly ballpark, but a substantial amplification um, that we see. And so I was wondering, you know, where does that come from? Is that evidence for financial frictions? Maybe it's really hard for Colombian banks to raise equity. Uh, that could well be, although the effects appear to be persistent. So you just kind of expect that to, over time, they'd be able to retain earnings and, and solve that problem. And then going one step further again, even if we take this differential effects on interest rates as given, so 0.8 percentage points on an average loan interest rate of 18%, we see a really big impact on lending volumes. That impact is about 24 to 31%, depending on the specification. So normal elasticities for CNI loans in the US are two, and so, so you'd expect something much smaller. You know, on the order of 2%. What's going on there? I'd really like to know more what's going on there. It's not substitution, because if you aggregate at the firm level, you still get this result, and it has real effect. Uh, these, at these firms, total assets go down, sales go down by big numbers, like 20%. Um, it made me wonder if there's perhaps something going on, like a switch from lending to subsidiaries to parents. Uh, could, could that be what's going on? I don't know enough about the Colombian uh, economy to, to know whether that's a factor or not. Maybe it's just credit rationing, that banks just cut off credit um, in addition to raising loan interest rates to the more affected firms. So um, I have some other comments, uh, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and, um, and do the remaining ones bilaterally. Yeah, thanks a lot, Skanda. Uh, I would like to collect first questions and then ask the author to address them all in one go. Uh, three quick remiss, uh, remarks I would like to do. We'll collect questions first from those in the room and then from those who have joined, on, joined online. I will take only three questions, but I see only three hands, and the rest we need to do afterwards, I guess. Uh, please speak your first, first your name and affiliation when asking a question. And for those in the room, please wait until the microphone has arrived so that also people online can, can hear you. So we start from the left to the right, the left hand side. Paul, if you could come. Hi, thank you. So this is a very interesting uh, presentation. It's Anatoly Segura from the Bank of Italy. A question related to the external validity. Uh, when it comes to, to the discussion of potential procyclicality of I, I, IFRS 9, 
that we, we, we had uh, here in the Euro area and have been also some uh, academic contributions. The issue was regarding the reclassification from stage one to stage two uh, at the beginning of a recession that was forcing the banks to, co to estimate the expected losses from uh, one year to the entire life, uh, lifetime of the, of the loans. So my question is, is that feature present in the, in the example you are, you are considering? And if not, I guess the, 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 the implication would be is that if anything, IFRS 9 would be more pro-cyclical than what you find in the Colombian case. Thank you. Thank you. The next is Peter in the last row, please. Peter Raupach, Deutsche Bundesbank. Uh, just for a better understanding, having seen these huge loan rates, uh, are we here in an environment of extremely high default risk, or is it rather just nominal rates and we have a high inflation? So if we are in the, in the first variant, then I wonder whether this is, let's call it a healthy cleansing effect, or is it just a other figures uh, than the ones we are used to. Thank you. I saw on the right-hand side, Jakob. Um, thank you, Jacob from the EBA. Uh, hi, Jose Luis. Um, so I was going to say a nice paper, right? I, I guess I have a slightly different take, uh, which is that if, if what you're really looking at is banks seeing... Uh, what they see as a request for overcapitalizing because the re regime changes, that make, then it makes a lot of sense that what you're seeing is that the banks fight back and try to avoid the overcapitalization by taking on more risk. And I particularly like your the last slide, which says actually they undo each other perfectly, right? Which to me is like a, let's say a standard Lucas critique finding, right? That actually you change the rules, you should expect the system to respond. So you know, as, aside from all the other stuff, I think that would be my interpretation, but I'd like to hear you read if you think I'm way off or where I am. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Any questions from our online community? And then you, if not, then we can also go out here. No, nothing? I have one question. Um, Costas Tzatzaronis. Hi, Costas. He was wondering if the paper distinguishes between the persistent procyclicality of addressing forward-looking losses in forward-looking LLPs as opposed to the procyclicality of the impact of truly through the cycle forward-looking LLPs on lending. Thank you. I think that's all. Then we have space for one last question, please. So I think that this reform gave firms a strong incentive to grow or uh, at least uh, gave loan officers uh, strong incentives to tell firms uh, to mark to market uh, some assets that had grown in value and so on. And uh, these uh, could explain why Skander is uh, skeptical about the high effects because of the companies that remained below the threshold are uh, weaker uh, along an unobserved dimension. So it would be and I would think that this effect becomes stronger and stronger as you go in time and firms have stronger and more time to adjust. Then we close the question row here and I give back to Jose Luis to respond to the discussion and also the questions, please. Yeah, so I will go in reverse order, but first uh, let me just uh, thank Skander for, for the excellent uh, suggestions. So on my Asunta, yeah, so in some regressions, we don't do regression discontinuity just because, precisely because what you just said. And so, and then in some regressions, it's lo, uh, lo, uh, it's the, this paper in, in revision, so it's, there are lots of robustness. So we, take, we, we move away from the threshold to avoid firms, which are, let's say, the very good firms, which will be close to the first threshold, they will want to switch to the other one. One thing that we should, we should check is the economic effects, whether they are reduced, uh, uh, going to your uh, suggestion. So costas, yeah, there are persistent effects and persistent effects, especially in crisis times. So this is the crisis times is the strongest uh, persistent effects. Jacob, I completely agree on that. I mean, it's just a point that I wanted even to highlight more here on the supervision. 
Uh, and, and that was my question to, to, to Enria that, you know, like at the end, nothing is about, it's not only regulation, it's just a supervision as well over and above the rules because the banks will try to adjust. Uh, yeah, Peter, loan rates high. Sometimes it's like, you know, like in these loans, sometimes the number, we should check very well these things because sometimes the numbers are high because you have the fees, the rates, and sometimes if the, you know, the drawdown is very small, so the, the loans are very small, so the interest rates could be high. So we should check on the interest rate whether it's driven by these uh, smaller uh, numbers. And at only, I, you know, stage one is also important because there was a change in stage one and two. You know, if we used to only have stage three and the introduction is stage one and two, and both uh, are important. And on a scandal, we will check the numbers. Uh, we are checking the numbers. Um, on basically the big, big number in the loan rates is, is what I answered to Peter. And then there is the issue, uh, and Maria Sunta as well, and then there is the issue of the external validity. And here, the external validity, these are forward-looking provisions. So, you know, it, what, one problem that I, in my mind, say more philosophical is that in, in medicine, they do lots of, uh, uh, you know, tests in order no, to be confident in a particular drug or something like that. So here, in order to understand better a particular law, we have to do, we have to have many, lots of evidences. And this is one. The external validity is that it's forward looking. We have the, we have the different recessions in good times uh, and bad times, both with, uh, with um, uh, the policy and without the policy. There is a state one and two versus purely stage three. And the effects are, you know, in a sense, they are related if you think about the COVID-19 crisis in Europe and the United States, which is once if they f uh, follow the expected credit loss, provisions will go up very high and there will, there will be a, a drop in credit. That is my interpretation why the regulators, supervision, uh, supervisors, you know, water down uh, these uh, change in provisioning uh, at the time of, of the COVID. So thanks a lot. <laughs>